1940s there arose an extraordinary movement known as the Latter Rain Revival. The movement began with a dramatic and powerful outpouring of God's Spirit in the Canadian town of North Battleford, Saskatchewan on February 12, 1948. While similar to Azusa Street in its breadth and its influence, the outpouring bore some distinction to Azusa Street as characterized more so by the use of the laying on of hands for the impartation of spiritual gifts than by tarrying and petitioning for the Holy Spirit through prayer. The gift of prophecy was also much more in operation, particularly personal prophecy. The Sharon Orphanage of North Battleford sent out teams of emissaries who spread revival fires across North America. Those persons and organizations who received the Latter Rain Movement would tend to have tremendous involvement and influence in the charismatic movement that would follow a short time thereafter. By 1948, there remained very few of the original pioneers who had experienced the events at Azusa Street and its secondary outpourings that occurred prior to World War I. Of the small handful of those left from early Pentecost was Fred F. Bosworth. While the North Battleford Assembly was associated with the Foursquare denomination, founded by Amy Simple McPherson, and while the Houghton brothers had a background in the Canadian Assemblies of God, the most notable figure from early Pentecost to have a leading role in the Latter Rain movement was Fred F. Bosworth, that pioneer who had most clearly and dramatically rejected that doctrine fundamental to the Pentecostal movement, the doctrine of initial evidence. This doctrine, as related in an earlier video, held that the baptism of the Holy Spirit would always be evidenced by the speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance, pursuant to Acts chapter 2, verse 4. Fred Bosworth's ministry bore a great distinction to those of other Pentecostal pioneers. His separation from the Pentecostal movement in 1918 over his rejection of the Pentecostal teaching, his publishing of a pamphlet refuting the doctrine of tongues as initial evidence, his influential radio ministry and his dramatic evangelistic healing crusades brought his ministry into distinction as the most undermining of the principle of tongues as initial evidence, which according to Pentecostals had been clearly established in Topeka, Kansas on January 1st of 1901. Recall that the outpouring in Topeka occurred under circumstances in which the doctrine of initial evidence was clearly affirmed at the moment the outpouring was received. According to Stanley Frodsham, while the spontaneous occurrence of speaking in tongues occurred many times at various places prior to Topeka, its meaning prior to Topeka was not understood. Frodsham writes, there were many who received the supernatural speaking in tongues toward the end of the first, last century. Most of them did not associate the phenomenon with the baptism in the Spirit received at Pentecost. They considered it one of the signs promised by the Lord in Mark 16, or one of the gifts of the Spirit referred to in the twelfth chapter of 1 Corinthians. While the supernatural phenomenon of tongues did not first occur at Topeka, this is where the Pentecostal movement first occurred. The movement being established when the experience was brought into clear association with the doctrine. Therefore, while the label Pentecostal is often used to describe anything supernatural in Christianity, that would be incorrect. This was a movement which was clearly established in the doctrine of initial evidence. After the Pentecostal movement seemed to initially run its course, its chief objector, F. F. Bosworth, would realize a remarkable resurgence in his ministry and go on to become the common thread linking the powerful movement of God which began in the 20th century to the powerful movement of God which began the second half of the 20th century. Because his ministry was marked by a rejection of the Pentecostal teaching of his time, his ministry would become largely responsible for the 20th century digression away from the classical Pentecostal teaching. Fred Bosworth was one of the early converts to Taoism. Recall that John Alexander Dowie, a world-traveling faith healer who had immigrated to America in 1888, had been brought into national prominence during the 1890s through an aggressive 
sensationalizing of his healing ministry. In the earlier years of his ministry, he seemed to operate a genuine, miraculous gift. During Dowie's years in Chicago, he had developed a wide following from all over the United States. On New Year's Day of 1900, he unveiled his plans for a utopian Christian community just north of Chicago, to be called Zion City, where biblical principles would be enforced, a sort of city of God that he would rule as its first apostle. As the community was built, it became populated by the most devout of Dowie's followers. After reading Dowie's newsletters, Fred Bosworth and his wife traveled to Dowie's Chicago church and thereafter became residents of his utopian community. He played in the band of Dowie's Christian Catholic Church and soon became its director. During this time, Dowie became increasingly autocratic and egocentric, declaring himself to be Elijah the Restorer, demanding the absolute obedience of all within his realm, and grossly mismanaging its various business affairs. This led to the financial collapse of Zion City, and a membership revolt which ousted Dowie from control over his organization. This occurred in the very same month, April of 1906, that Pentecost descended at Azusa Street in Los Angeles. Dowie had been a fierce opponent of the Pentecostal message. In 1904, one of his members, a Mrs. Waldron, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit through Charles Parham's Kansas ministry. She returned to Zion City and assisted a Mrs. Hall in receiving the same experience. Dowie acted quickly to force both women and their families from his community. Shortly after Dowie's iron-fisted rule collapsed in 1906, Charles Parham traveled to Zion City in the hope of taking advantage of the opportunity presented by its void in leadership to introduce Pentecost to that community, the morale of which was extremely low. Fred Bosworth attended Parham's meetings and received the Pentecostal experience with dozens of other Zionites, including John G. Lake, who would be powerfully utilized to spread Pentecost in South Africa. Within a year thereafter, he and Lake visited the Azusa Street Mission in Los Angeles. This photograph was taking, taken of Lake and Bosworth with William Seymour during that visit. Bosworth moved to Dallas, Texas in 1910 in order to pioneer a church. In June of 1911, he was reporting that a strong Pentecostal revival was occurring. William Durham, in his Pentecostal testimony newspaper, relates a letter he received from Bosworth during this time. He writes, Up to the date of Brother Bosworth's letter, no less than 185 had received the Holy Spirit and spoken in tongues. What is still better, there was no waning of the power, but rather it increase, and the weekly average of baptisms was increasing. All glory to our blessed God and his adorable Son, Jesus Christ. Shortly after making this report to Durham's Pentecostal testimony, Bosworth traveled to Indiana to convince the healing evangelist Maria Woodworth Etter to conduct revival services in his church. Woodworth Etter had operated a miracle ministry since the early 1880s that was characterized by extraordinary signs and wonders. She assumed his pulpit in July of 1912, and she stayed until December. She conducted lengthy and momentous meetings characterized by dramatic supernatural phenomenon. Stanley Frodsham writes of many baptisms. Bosworth writes of slaying power, balls of fire and lights in and around the tent, great hosts of angels just above the audience. When Pentecostals organized their primary denomination, the Assemblies of God, in 1914, Bosworth was one of its founders. And there is no other Pentecostal figure with quite the pedigree of F.F. F. Bosworth, who personally knew and served un under the notorious healing ministry of John Dowie, who received the Pentecostal experience under the ministry of Charles Parham, of the Topeka outpouring, who traveled to Azusa Street in the midst of the outpouring there, and who would be a founding member of the main Pentecostal denomination. But all was not well in Bosworth's reception of the Pentecostal teaching. And so, in 1918, Bosworth entered into conflict with the Assemblies of God on the issue of the Pentecostal doctrine.
and this conflict led to his separation from the denomination and therefore organizationally from Pentecostalism in general. The conflict began when Bosworth invited Alfred Garr to fill in for him at his Dallas church. Garr was a powerfully anointed missionary evangelist who had received his baptism at Azusa Street in 1906. Upon commencing his duties in Dallas, Garr discovered that Bosworth's congregation lacked a zeal, was in confusion concerning the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and that controversy existed on the issue of whether tongues was even the necessary evidence of spirit baptism. He took matters into hand and began to zealously preach the doctrine of initial evidence to Bosworth's congregation. And naturally, this divided the congregation between those hungry for the baptism and angered those who were resistant to the doctrine. The result is related by Gar's biographer, Steve Thompson. He writes, Within weeks, the elders of the congregation wrote a letter to the Assemblies of God implying that Bosworth should no longer be their pastor. In response, F. F. Bosworth wrote a letter to the Assemblies of God implicating Alfred Gar as the source of the letter. He was obviously hurt and felt betrayed by the letter and brought by Alfred. Bosworth resigned as pastor of the congregation in April 1918, and from the Assemblies of God three months later. He would go on to become one of the foremost healing evangelists of the 20th century. Fred Bosworth was not only neglecting the restored truth of Pentecost to the detriment of his congregation, he was rejecting that truth. Rejecting the fundamental doctrine of Pentecost, Bosworth could not keep his credentials with the Assemblies of God, for he stood in rejection of the main article of faith peculiar to Pentecostals, and that was the doctrine of initial evidence. And this is apparent both in his inability to maintain credentialing within a Pentecostal body, and evident by the fact that he shortly thereafter published an argument refuting the doctrine of initial evidence, and this was entitled, do all speak in tongues. In this pamphlet, he uses the same reasoning as had A.B. Simpson several years previous, which refused distinction between the sign of tongues and the gift. Bosworth himself maintained that he received the gift of tongues under Charles Parham's ministry, and that he continued to operate the gift. Through his pamphlet, Bosworth denounced the Pentecostal teaching as serious doctrinal error, arguing that there was absolutely no distinction between tongues, as what occurred in the evangelistic accounts from the book of Acts, wherein it was given as a sign of the Spirit's initial reception, and the doctrinal instructions given by Paul to the Corinthians concerning the operation of tongues as a spiritual gift. He began his argument with the proposition that some of those most anointed for ministry had never spoken in tongues, and expressed his belief that many who had received the experience had not likely been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Bosworth argued that any manifestation of the Holy Spirit should be sufficient to constitute the evidence one had received the Holy Spirit, and stated that the manifestation of any gift is such evidence. He writes, God's definition of a gift is the manifestation of the Spirit. The speaking in tongues on the day of Pentecost was the manifestation of the Spirit, and therefore is identical with the gift of tongues, about which Paul writes to the Corinthians. We therefore contend that this was the gift of tongues that God set in the church. Thus for Bosworth, there was essentially no particular sign of the Spirit's baptism, only the gifts which the Spirit left the believer as a token that they had received. Bosworth further reasoned that since prophecy is identified as a gift superior to the gift of tongues, then logically prophecy should constitute equal if not greater evidence of the Spirit's baptism. He writes, Why not consider the more valuable manifestation of the Spirit as at least as good evidence that one has been baptized in the Spirit as the less valuable manif manifestation? Why should we say that the man who is superior and has the more valuable manifestation of the Spirit is not baptized in the Spirit, and the inferior man is because he has a manifestation of the Spirit less in value. Although he argued that prophecy should logically constitute equal 
or greater evidence of the Spirit's reception than would tongues. Bosworth ultimately denied there should be any outwardly observable evidence, stating, The word evidence in the scriptures is never used in connection with a spiritual gift or manifestation, making faith to depend upon any sign or physical manifestation. But the Apostle distinctly states that faith is the evidence. Anything that is to be received in answer to prayer is to be received by faith. Bosworth also argued that the true operation of the gift of tongues is not at will, but only as the Spirit gives utterance. He writes, The fact here mentioned that the gift of tongues is always the, the manifestation of the Spirit refutes the theory held by many that the gift of tongues is the ability to speak in tongues at will. Perhaps the strongest argument made by, made by Bosworth was the lack of a specific rule laid down in Scripture that expressly established tongues as the universal sign of the Holy Spirit's reception. Bosworth writes, Then is it not strange that not one of the inspired writers of any of the epistles in the New Testament churches, preachers and saints scattered abroad, ever made the slightest reference to that kind of speaking in tongues which, as many allege, is the evidence of the baptism? Think of it, and think again. All the New Testament epistles and not a single mention of this doctrine. It is nowhere taught in scriptures, but is assumed from the fact that in three instances recorded in the Acts, they spoke in tongues as a result of the baptism. We should consider the merits and the flaws of Bosworth's arguments. Bosworth argued that any manifestation of the Holy Spirit should constitute sufficient evidence. This argument has at least three significant flaws, beginning with the fact that the argument is circular. The argument presupposes that one is manifesting the Holy Spirit. The second flaw of the argument is that, it, is that it disregards the fact that miraculous operations of the Holy Spirit through men were given well prior to Christ's death and resurrection, and operated well prior to the, the day the Holy Spirit was given to the Church. The seventy elders of Israel prophesied under Moses, and men would prophesy at such time the Holy Spirit came upon them even hundreds of years before Christ's resurrection and the day of Pentecost. In fact, all the spiritual gifts were demonstrated before Christ ascended, such as healings, miracles, and demonstrations of faith. Just read the 11th chapter of Hebrews. Faith in God has produced miracles since the days of Enoch. Divine knowledge was exercised by many prophets, and even the manifestation of true prophecy is no evidence one has received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The great antagonist of Israel, Balaam, prophesied by the Spirit of God, and even unbelievers may truly prophesy, as evidenced by those who murdered the Messiah. Of Caiaphas we read, And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest of that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. While prophecy is certainly a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, it is not peculiar to the Pentecostal baptism and cannot be regarded as specific evidence that one has been baptized. What is peculiar to the Pentecostal era is the sign of tongues, that not having occurred until Christ was resurrected and ascended. Remember John's words, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. The Lord's glorification was the necessary precursor to the Holy Spirit being given to men, and the only sign which occurred peculiar to this new dispensation was tongues. Bosworth also argued that the true operation of the gift of tongues is limited to as the Spirit gives utterance. But contrary to Bosworth's assertion,
tongues is normally not operated in this way, not as it relates to the gift given to the church. Bosworth included prophecy and any manifestation of the Holy Spirit as operating as the Spirit wills, rather than as the gifted individual wills. But this is contrary to Scripture. Paul writes, And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. And this must necessarily be the case. Otherwise, it would make little sense for Paul to direct the proper order of prophecy or tongues within the church. While Bosworth mentions this fact as a common argument from Pentecostals, he never does address the argument. Clearly, the gift of tongues, as also the gift of prophecy, did not operate within the first century churches as the Spirit gave them utterance, although the sign of tongues, as what occurred at initial Spirit baptism, clearly did operate in this way. And we have this from Acts 2.4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The source of Bosworth's error was his failure to distinguish a sign which operates independent of human volition from a gift which operates in subjection to human volition. Bosworth also argued that faith is the only evidence of the Spirit's baptism. That faith is the only evidence of the Spirit's baptism would appear contradicted most clearly by Acts chapter 10, wherein Peter, and later the other apostles, did in fact use the demonstration of tongues as evidence that the Gentiles had received the Holy Ghost. The incorrectness of Bosworth's assertion is also clear from the account of the 120 who received the Holy Ghost in Jerusalem and the account of the twelve disciples of John in Ephesus. We might perceive that in making this assertion, Bosworth engages in a common fallacy of Bible teachers, which is sometimes called believism, wherein the assertion of one's belief makes the thing true, regardless of outward experience. Bosworth writes that anything that is to be received in answer to prayer is to be received by faith and quotes Hebrews 11.1, 1, which states, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. However, the context of Hebrews chapter 11 is not the baptism in the Holy Spirit, but the procurement of things hoped for. Paul writes, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Hope relates to things not as yet obtained. And these are the things that require faith. But while belief in Jesus Christ is a necessary precursor to our receiving the Holy Spirit, this is not to say that the experience itself must be a matter of believing without the benefit of real experience. God does not leave us to doubt in this regard. Other, otherwise, what sense would it make for Paul to ask people whether they had received the Holy Spirit? For he asked of the twelve in Ephesus, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? The Galatians as well clearly had demonstrable evidence that they had received the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, it would not have made sense for Paul to reason with them as follows. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Did the Galatians receive by the means of faith? Of course they did, but were they required to accept their baptism as somehow mystically accomplished despite some tangible evidence? Well, such a conclusion would fail logic. Bosworth also argued from the vantage point that an explicit doctrine is not stated in the New Testament epistles. Bosworth pointed out that the New Testament epistles are silent on the subject of what constitutes the prima facie evidence of the Spirit's baptism, and therefore neither should the Church lay down a doctrine of what constitutes the evidence. While Mr. Bosworth is correct in his observation that the epistles are silent, his conclusion would appear faulty. While it is granted that there is no expressly stated doctrine in the epistles, the doctrine nonetheless has the support of Scripture. 
we know without a doubt that tongues constitutes at least a sign of the Spirit's baptism, because the apostles accepted that it did. We read, And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues, and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost, as well as we? Think of this. We have no direct teaching from the epistles that tongues constitutes any sign at all of receiving the Spirit. Nevertheless, we know that it does constitute a sign of spirit baptism based upon the record from the book of Acts. And what this means is that the, his, the historical record in Acts is a sufficient basis upon which to found doctrine. For who can deny this as the meaning of Acts chapter 10? The issue which remains is whether or not tongues constitutes the conclusive evidence of the Spirit's baptism. There is always a myriad of things that can constitute some evidence for anything. For instance, attending a Pentecostal church is some evidence that a man has received the baptism, but it is by no means conclusive evidence. Even observing a man speaking in tongues is not conclusive evidence, because no one can assuredly know what is happening within another person except the other person. Only for that individual may tongues constitute a conclusive sign, which is really the only important concern, that is, that the person baptized into Christ comprehend the fact of his or her baptism. And therefore, to the outside observer, tongues does constitute some evidence, just as prophecy constitutes some evidence. The problem for Mr. Bosworth was that prophecy and generalized miracles of faith occurred prior to the Holy Ghost being given, and prior to Jesus being glorified, while tongues has no mention prior to the day of Pentecost, after which it did constitute a sign of something. Because of its sudden appearance upon Christ's glorification, therefore we know it as the peculiar sign of the Spirit's reception. And thus it is reasonable to receive one's own experience of speaking in tongues as, as the Spirit gives utterance that is, the non-volitional manifestation of the phenomenon, as even conclusive evidence of the Spirit's baptism. But if one is content to satisfy themselves in working a miracle or prophesying as evidence of their own baptism of the Holy Spirit, they may do so. However, they have slim support in Scripture. It is ironic that the greatest damage to the restored teaching came through a man who had received his baptism under the teaching of the doctrine's original messenger, Charles Parham. The doctrine that was so clearly confirmed in Topeka, preached by Parham, and which led to the Azusa Street outpouring, was rejected and publicly undermined, all the while Bosworth carried on a fantastic ministry of signs and wonders, which included many receiving the baptism in spite of his erroneous teaching. But since Bosworth did not declare the full truth, his meetings, while full of power and other evidences of God's willingness to act, became characterized by phenomenon which strayed from that which was strictly Pentecostal. He writes, Proper instruction followed by consecration and prayer will in every instance bring down the baptism in the Holy Spirit, but it will not always bring down the manifestation of tongues. But if the Pentecostal doctrine of initial evidence was correct, then Bosworth's leavened teaching was resulting in power and demonstration absent the sealing of the Holy Spirit. Bosworth's teaching on receiving the Holy Spirit not only ran inconsistent to Pentecostal doctrine, but it began to run astray of the teachings of Christ. He wrote, Repeated seeking and methods never used in Scripture have been employed to get all the seekers through to the evidence so called. But the teaching of Jesus Christ was just the opposite. As to receiving the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, Yet because of persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. And I say to you, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you.
For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it shall be opened. Now suppose one of your fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he has asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Jesus clearly taught persistence in asking as the proper means of receiving the Holy Spirit. But Bosworth counseled men otherwise. While many other men who taught as Bosworth would simply be mistaken, Bosworth's teaching must be regarded as false, given that his teaching carried the manifestation of signs and wonders. Following his separation from organized Pentecostalism, Bosworth became the forerunner of a genre that was to come. He began conducting faith healing campaigns in large tents, sponsored oddly enough by the Christian and Missionary Alliance, the CMA, the organization which had only recently rejected the restored truth of Pentecost. As the CMA was being abandoned in droves by the Spirit Baptized, who were entering the ranks of such organizations as the Assemblies of God, Bosworth went the reverse direction. In so doing, Bosworth's teachings digressed in substance back to the pre-Pentecostal message of the late 19th century which was held by the healing movement in which the CMA had played such a principal role. The CMA was now the publisher of Bosworth's pamphlets and publications. With his clearly anointed ministry and doctrinal declension in respect to the Pentecostal renewal, his message narrowed upon a theme of healing for the natural body. While his message was certainly an evan evangelistic call for salvation through Jesus Christ, it became diminished from the fuller message so recently restored that God would baptize men into the body of Christ if they would ask. The principal doctrine for which the healing movement is associated might be regarded as the doctrine of healing through the atonement. And this was a doctrine that had originally been advanced by Baptist theologian A.J. Gordon in his 1882 book, The Ministry of Healing. The doctrine maintained that the sacrifice of Christ at Calvary not only atoned for sin, but constituted the basis of our divine healing as well. When the doctrine was taught during the Holiness Movement, it was generally intended to be an encouragement for the sick to continue to hope in God for their healing, elevating healing for the body to the same theological standing as that upon which the atonement for sin is founded. The doctrine had been controversial even within the Holiness Movement not necessarily through a disbelief in divine healing, but through a sense that it detracted from the central message of the cross as addressing the issue of sin rather than health. There was also concern over the fact that scripture tending to support the doctrine was sparse and even absent from the teachings of Paul. Given its lineage from the healing movement, the doctrine of healing through the atonement came into wide acceptance by Pentecostals early in the movement and stories abound of Pentecostal families choosing suffering and sometimes death rather than to resort to medicine for the cure, under the apprehension that to allow another than Christ to heal was tantamount to allowing another than Christ to save. For instance, in 1919 the Pentecostal Holiness Church was divided when a southern preacher dared publish an article maintaining that going to a doctor implied no lack of faith. And this raised a great furor in the Pentecostal churches, given the deep sensibilities toward the doctrine. The preacher, Hugh Bowling, was expelled from the church, given this published statement. He said, I do not believe in lying about divine healing. I do not believe that sickness is evidence of unbelief. I do not believe that healing is paralleled with salvation in the atonement. And thus the doctrine that had been controversial in the holiness movement became controversial in the Pentecostal movement as well. Working now in close association with the CMA, an organization that by this time had rejected the restored Pentecostal truth of initial evidence, Bosworth's supernatural ministry and message
became narrowly focused upon its non-Pentecostal aspects, that is, a generalized exhortation to salvation through faith, divine healing, and a pre-Pentecostal era message on spirit baptism, which relegated the experience to the ambiguity that existed during the 19th century. His preaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, given his rejection of the doctrine of initial evidence, necessarily rendered his message sufficiently vague so as to fit within the doctrinal abstraction held by the CMA, which, having lost the blessing that accompanied its original thrust, now had a genuine Pentecostal leader to reinvigorate its traditional message of healing. In 1924, Bosworth published his well-known classic, Christ the Healer, where he emphatically asserted the doctrine that had been popularized by the healing movement many years earlier, known as Healing Through the Atonement. In his book, Bosworth aggressively promoted this doctrine not merely as an encouragement to faith, but as a redemptive right which men must exercise. He writes as follows. Since Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is, Lord is our peace, is one of Christ's redemptive names, has not every man a redemptive right to obtain peace from him? Has not every man likewise a redemptive right to obtain victory from Jehovah Nisi? Has not every man a redemptive right to obtain the gift of righteousness from Jehovah Zekinu, etc.? If so, why has not every man a redemptive right to obtain healing from Jehovah Rapha? He characterized this doctrine as God's word, the non-acceptance of which being tantamount to non-acceptance non of the same, an affront to God. And this rather extreme form of the doctrine reveals one reason why there was, there was significant concern originally over its orthodoxy. Besides its relatively sparse support in the apostolic writings, the doctrine was controversial due to the, the specter of its logical extension and Bosworth's zealous promotion of the doctrine brought him into approving some of its problematic and non-orthodox implications. While he made an exception for those committing willful sin and those upon whom sickness was a form of div divine chastisement, Bosworth maintained that it was always God's will to heal. He writes, Since Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, how can God justify us and at the same time require us to remain under the law's curse. If healing was not provided for all in redemption, how did all in the multitude obtain Christ or obtain from Christ the healing that God did not provide? He healed them all. As it was always God's will to heal, the only reason men were not healed was want of faith. And this correlation of sickness and disease with a want of faith when cast into the same theological framework with the atonement, will necessarily lead to the conclusion that if we have not the faith to be healed, then we have not the faith to be saved. Conclusion, to be unhealed is to be unsaved. Thus Bosworth's teachings were beginning to lose their apostolic ring. He writes, Sin and sickness have passed from me to Calvary. Salvation and health have passed from Calvary to me. With bodily health standing as a sign of the divine favor, Bosworth found new significance in certain Old Testament passages that seemed to assure the godly man of life and health. Bosworth argued that it was God's will for men to fulfill their years, citing such verses as Exodus chapter 23, I will take sickness away from the midst of thee, the number of thy days I will fulfill. Psalm 90 verse 10, the days of our years are threescore and ten. And the 102nd Psalm, Take me not away in the midst of my days. Ecclesiastes 7.17, Why shouldest thou die before thy time? Even a man's death, Bosworth maintained, should not occur through sickness, but rather through the sterile act of God withdrawing the spirit from the man. He uses the verse, Thou takest away their breath, they die and returned to their dust. And we might interject that it was decidedly not the outcome for Christ, of whom the Pentecostal message was, in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation?
for his life is taken from the earth. And so Bosworth's message became increasingly one of a gospel for the natural man, as the message of the cross became rather the secret to health and longevity. He writes, Why were the Israelites required to eat the flesh of the Passover lamb for physical strength, unless we too can receive physical life or strength from Christ? Bosworth asserted that a man should always be in perfect health, or else he was not serving God. For instance, he naturalizes Paul's reference to grace, writing, No man can abound to every good work while confined to a sick room. Rather than evidence of the coming of the kingdom of God, divine healing became regarded as an end in itself, and God's word the means. As Bosworth asserted the verity of this doctrine as constituting God's infallible word, faith in this doctrine became for him the seed with a view to a material reaping. He writes, Praying for healing with a faith-destroying words, if it be thy will, is not planting the seed, it is destroying the seed. And no longer can the church pray for the sick with a faith-destroying qualifying phrase, if it be thy will. But this was manifestly false teaching. No longer was it, Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. The message became, God, you have promised me life in the body. His message was a gospel of good news for the natural man, a rather extreme slant upon an already controversial doctrine, which seems to have paved a road which many would follow, making ever more bold assertions upon what was God's preordained will for the natural man that would allow him continuity of strength in this world. Bosworth's book became something of a primer for healing evangelists in the glory years to come in the wake of the latter rain revival which would sweep North America before going abroad. After Bosworth's healing crusades of the 1920s and 1930s, he retired to Florida in 1947, but only for a short time. He would come out of retirement to join a list of over 60 healing evangelists loosely affiliated under the Voice of Healing banner. After a long and fruitful ministry, his life ultimately ran true to his oft-quoted verse. Psalm 90, verse 10. The days of our years are threescore and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. When Bosworth reached eighty years of age, he announced, This is the greatest day of my life. God has shown me that I am going home. Consistent to his doctrine, he would live out his days to become virtually the last of the original Pentecostal pioneers. And Bosworth died on January 23, 1958, six days after achieving four score years. Although F.F. F. Bosworth is commonly associated with the doctrine of healing through the atonement, the doctrine was not original with him, neither were his expansions upon the doctrine his own inventions. Bosworth borrowed heavily from other writers, and most notably from the very controversial positive confession theologian E. W. Kenyon. Kenyon is widely regarded as the father of the word of faith and prosperity message teachings, teachings which would savage the Pentecostal movement in the decades to come, and which continue to constitute a substantial doctrinal underpinning to the modern prophetic movement. Bosworth included much of Kenyon's writings and teachings in his book, especially the part entitled Our Confession, and he recommends Kenyon's teachings in the end of that chapter. Bosworth writes, Most of the thoughts expressed in this sermon I have brought together by permission from the writings of the late Reverend E. W. Kenyon. Although Bosworth is most commonly associated with the extremes that he advanced upon the doctrine of healing through the atonement, well, this would arguably misapprehend his role in the progression of theology. Whether it was his rejection of the doctrine of initial evidence, which would seem the most pertinent legacy of his ministry, and that which had the most significant effect upon the course of church history.
In the interest of perspective, we should understand that for an original pioneer of early Pentecost to cast aside the doctrine of initial evidence would be of like principle, if not like degree, to Calvin or Knox, casting aside the pivotal truth of their own time and movement, which was justification by faith. But whether he was correct or incorrect in his doctrine of healing, Bosworth's almost exclusive emphasis on doctrine and practice relating to healing of the body would seem to have been the logical avenue of travel for a miracle ministry in rejection of initial evidence. And this seems apparent for a couple of reasons. To begin, initial evidence was that doctrine most singularly responsible for severing Pentecostalism from the holiness and the healing movements. It was certainly the doctrine that was responsible for finally severing Pentecostalism from its last remaining ally in the Christian Missionary Alliance, which was the principal then existing organ of the healing movement. And therefore, having rejected initial evidence, Bosworth was repo repositioned theologically with the holiness movement, of which healing was the primary thrust. But this is not to suppose that he was in like orthodoxy, for Bosworth's position was as the holiness movement under the Pentecostal anointing, an anointing that had been denied it from heaven once the truth of Pentecost was delivered and re rejected by it. Furthermore, if it was true that tongues constituted the initial evidence of receiving the Holy Spirit, well, Bosworth's teachings to the contrary would certainly have reintroduced the confusion that God had removed by virtue of the circumstances of the outpouring in Topeka, Kansas. Can any deny that the purpose of receiving the Holy Spirit is primarily the advancement of the kingdom of God within the believer, meaning our sanctification, and thence our resurrection? But Bosworth had cut out a doctrinal leg out from under Pentecost, and this left his only viable direction of ministry as being the pursuit of healing, which digressed into a gospel for the natural man. While he healing for the body is certainly an evidence of the evan evangelistic anointing, irrespective of one's view of the theological basis for healing, it is not, in and of itself, the full gospel of God. Bosworth represented the return of a dispensation cut off in an essential part by a rejection of truth's advent. And Bosworth's story is disturbing given his prominence in the Pentecostal Restoration, as a great apostolic truth was restored to the church amongst a relatively small handful of persons who became powerfully anointed messengers of the true seal of God, the baptism of the Holy Spirit a seal that awakens men to the reality of sanctification and the hope of a glorious resurrection. For one of those anointed few to do an about-face on this truth is a disquieting thought. Jesus said, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathers not with me scatters abroad. The de decades following the Pentecostal renewal would be characterized as an era of the scattering of this vital truth.